Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our series, Recentering Eco-Critical Knowledge of the Natural World. Uh, this is a Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous talk. Uh, part of the series, uh, this is the second actually in the series. The first one is called In Place, Representing Environmental Racism and Remediation on Tribal Lands and Communities of Color. This talk today is called In Place, The Aesthetics of Placemaking Through Land-Based Practices. And the last one will be August 19th, uh, In Place, Ecologies of Sound in the Southwest. SciArt Santa Fe is a small art science integration nonprofit. That's the simplest way to put it. And we provide uh, public programming uh, that is pretty wide ranging, but all of it brings art and science together. Uh, so uh, we feature artists, scientists, and people who do both. Uh, we're part of a network of laser hosts uh, that Leonardo, the International Society for Art, Science, and Technology, uh, has selected around the world. I think there, there are around 35, 36 of us, and we all host these talks for the public. Uh, you can find out more about us at sciartsantafe.org, and you can find out more about Leonardo uh, and the International Society for Art, Science, and Technology and the Laser Talks at leonardo.info. This program is made possible with the support of the New Mexico Humanities Council and the National Endowment for the Humanities. So any findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities or the New Mexico Humanities Council. Uh, this talk with this beautiful, these beautiful graphics, this is uh, in place, place making through land-based practices. We're talking about art practices that use uh, the earth and land as medium or topic or method. So today, the aesthetics of placemaking through land-based practices. Uh, we are speaking with Joanna Keen Lopez, who was born in Albuquerque. Uh, she's a multidis multidisciplinary artist whose work blurs the boundaries between contemporary sculpture and architecture through the medium of adobe mud. And by working with materials of adobe architecture, earthen plaster, alise, which is a clay slip paint, her work addresses con conceptions of sculpture and engagement with land. So Joanna's work seeks to heal and repair a sense of multi-generational roots in New Mexico. Uh, Joanna is a grant recipient of the Fulcrum Fund of the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts and the Andrew, Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And she was included in Americans for the Arts Public Art Year in Review Award. Chrissy Orr is our other speaker today. She's born in Scotland. She's a descendant of the Picts, the Painted Ones. She's an artist, an animateur, and creative investigator, focused on animating a relational aesthetic around community, both human and non-human, and sight with issues relevant to both. Uh, Chrissy has created innovative, provocative, community-based interdisciplinary projects in diverse areas of the world and is recognized internationally for her pioneering work. She is the recipient of the Santa Fe Mayor's Award for Excellence in the Arts, and she is a founder of Seed Broadcast Collective. She's also the co-founder of the Academy for the Love of Learning's El Otro Lado Project and the Institute for Living Story and is presently the Academy's Creative Practice Fellow. Now, moderating this talk is uh, Dr. Susan Elizabeth Ryan. She is a professor of art history at Louisiana State University and an affiliate of the LSU Center for Computational Technology. She taught contemporary and new media art history uh, and co-founded an interdisciplinary art engineering curriculum at LSU for more than 25 years. She has lectured, lectured internationally on dress and technology and MIT Press published her history of art, dress and technology entitled Garments of Paradise, Wearable Discourse in the Digital Age that was published in 2014. Uh, some of her earlier publications include Somehow a Past, the autobiography of Marston and Hartley, which was published by MIT Press in 95 
and Robert Indiana, Figures of Speech, uh, published by Yale University Press in 2000. Hello, this is from, I'm in Santa Fe, New Mexico, part of the ancestral lands of the Tiwa Pueblo. And I'm virtually inserted in my garden. In today's conversation, in place, the aesthetics of placemaking through land-based practices will explore practices based in ancient earth-based knowledge that forge relationships through shared aesthetic experiences. As an art historian, I witnessed the emergence of land art or earthworks as we called it in the 1970s. Those big iconic pieces like Robert Smithson's Spiral Jetty in Utah or Walter Dean Maria's Lightning Field southwest of Albuquerque. But there were others that focused much more on environmentalist or community-based projects. One example, if I can get my screen shared here. Okay, I'm not able to share my screen. There it is. You see it? Yes. All right. One example was a house built in the early 70s by sculptor David Lynn in the then remote community of Canyon, California. Lynn was an established sculptor, but decided to hand build a house using in place trees and stone, altering the land as little as possible. Building it involved other locals who were also raising houses in a similar way without concrete or asphalt, often with solar power and often without permits. Lynn's work was described in a famous art forum essay by editor Philip Leder, who wrote, as far as Lynn was concerned, every sculptural idea he ever had was in his building. The revolution in Lynn's arts, if there was one, was dictated by the terrain. Leader's article framed the work forever as art, which allowed it to become more visible as a new thought about engaging with place. A bit later was Meg Webster's kitchen garden at Houston's Contemporary Art Museum. Weber, Webster dug up the landscaping and with local volunteers created a community garden that benefited people living nearby, many of whom probably couldn't afford tickets to the museum's shows. It was remarkable to see individuals normally invisible to museum goers, digging in the grounds, spreading compost, and eventually walking off with the harvest. I can un un stop share, okay. I use these examples hoping to sketch a beginning context for Chrissy and Joanna's work. But the artists here today go beyond the pieces I've mentioned and address traditional, even ancient, and often indigenous practices of building and growing food and sharing stories. It's their wisdom concerning place-based forms of knowledge that we seek today. Joanna using the material of adobe and Chrissy the many cultures of seeds. Uh, and I just wanted to know her uh, copy of her, um, her seed broadcast, which is a kind of uh, newsprint journal uh, that many of you may have seen around town in the past. So don't forget there's a chat section where you can enter comments or questions for later on. So I'm going to ask my first question uh, and I'm going to start with Chrissy. Um, how would you interpret the phrase in place and what in place practices do you engage in? Who or what guided you in this exploration? Mm, such a great question. And uh, I also want to, uh, just before I answer that question, acknowledge that I'm on the traditional lands of the Tewa peoples, Oge, Apuge, White Shell Water Place. And I give a deep bow of gratitude to the Tewa peoples, the people, the indigenous peoples of this land for keeping the seeds of resilience alive. And I also want to acknowledge that I'm not of this place. I'm up from Scotland and I could be called, in fact, sometimes I do call myself an invasive species, but I really am trying to seek not to be. So I'm just going to uh, share my screen here if I can. 
uh, to start off with some of your question here. Uh, let's see if it works. Can everyone see that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Yeah. So really the term in place uh, began to challenge me. Um, I love that term in place, even although, you know, I'm now living in a place that I don't call home. But uh, it began to challenge me when I uprooted myself from my homeland of Scotland. Um, you know, I moved from the soft, damp mists of the highlands to the dry, spiky desert. And, you know, I moved here in 1986, I think it was. I moved here permanently. But I had been here in 1978 uh, when my daughter actually was, uh, who was born in Scotland, was just six months old. And her father that I met in Scotland is actually from this area. And we ended up... Uh, running a project, believe it or not, in Window Rock um, on the Diné reservation with the Diné peoples. And it was that time in, uh, this was 1978, yeah, that made such a huge impact on me, really ex feeling into this experience of the new landscape of New Mexico and sensing how the land informed a whole way of being for the people that lived for generations on that land. And that sensibility was woven into the fabric of their rugs, into the jewelry, into the pottery they made, and as I said, into their whole way of being. So that really kicked off an inquiry for me and um, we moved back to Europe, but I really wanted to come back and come back to New Mexico and continue that inquiry. So, um, you know, I've been exploring what it means to be in place and what it means, what happens to us when we uproot ourselves? What happens, you know, from what happens when we uproot root ourselves from our homeland and how do we become of place when our ancestors are far away? Do they follow us? I keep wondering that. And I realized actually that I had to learn a new way of being that needed to be guided by this New Mexican landscape. And I intuitively knew that I needed to be guided by the wisdom that sits in place. And so actually at that time, um, I came across this quote, which I love by a pro elder. It says, you know, I think if people stay somewhere long enough, even white people, the spirits begin to speak to them. It's the power of spirits coming from the land. The spirits and the old powers aren't lost. They just need people to be around long enough and the spirit will begin to influence them. So I've really held that quote to heart and made a real commitment uh, to stay here in New Mexico over a long period of time. As I said, I've now been here since 86 and to uh, really focus my work uh, with communities in New Mexico. Um, so and here's something I'd also like to share around this idea of in place and how, you know, coming from Scotland, this was something I wrote quite early on and it's from an essay called Imprints. Um, so it's just a very short sex section. It says, my feet are layered and lined with memories. The knowledge that gathered on my souls is of, of cobblestones, gray granite, dark moist earth, heather, moss and bracken, the sea salts, the sea, the, sorry, the salt seas all penetrated my being. 
these embedded patterns have carried with me to the northern New Mexico desert, where I walk today along the living river. The old patterns merge with the new, that of water engraved mud and rock, prickles and wind-blown hard red earth. It is through the soles of my feet that I gain my sense of place, and it is through my intuitive sensibility to place that my creativity emerges. And this was part of a much larger essay, but this really points to uh, one of my major practices, which is walking. And I've always been a walker. And over the years, I've actually developed uh, a very intentional way of walking so that I can, and this can either happen individually or with a group of people, so that we can begin to uncover the stories and the wisdom that's been covered up and really hone in and to see underneath, to see things that maybe our eyes do not see. So walking is a huge practice for me. I walk all the time. And before I ever start a project, I walk the place, I walk the community with really a way to feel into the sense. Um, but you know, there's many practices that uh, keep my creative edge alive and curious, um, you know, and the other major one at the moment is through my work with Seed Broadcast, um, which I co-founded in 2011, I think now, with Jeanette Hartman. And uh, we have been working with and talking with, being in conversation with uh, farmers, traditional farmers here in Northern New Mexico. And that has really led me into the practice. I felt if I was really talking with these farmers, I needed to practice farming myself. And so I'm actually very lucky to uh, have friends that have a piece of land up uh, just outside Española where I grow ancient varieties of corn, ancient wheats and um, beans. And this practice actually has uh, really opened my creative way into a much more resilient and much more truthful way. I feel if I'm going to work with community here in New Mexico, whether it's the human or non-human community, I really, really need to work also within the land. And, um, you know, I love to clear space around my plants. It's one of my favorite things to do. We could call it weeding. Uh, but, you know, weeds are also very important. But I love to clear that space around the plants so the plants can actually really grow and become the plant that they need to be. And it's really when I'm down on my knees in the soil with the plants that I find my rootedness and inspiration. It's really then that the reciprocity begins to happen and uh, I feel that that is something that there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it when you feel that reciprocity. So I'm going to stop there because I know I can go on and on and on and I want to give time for Johanna. Maybe we can be in a conversation. It's such a huge topic. Back to the same uh, ideas. So keep those slides handy. Um, to Joanna, that moment yeah. is, repeat the question. I enjoyed that, Chrissy. Thank you so much. It's oh, really a pleasure. 
Yeah, and I, I really resonated um, with what you were speaking about uh, as far as being in, in land and like the spirits of the land. And if you're there, you know, and in really engaging and being there that it's, you know, like an animism of place. So that was, I really, really enjoyed that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Joanna, if you want to answer, um, you're interpreting the idea of in place. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I'll go ahead and share my screen as well. So um, I, um, my name is Joanna Keen Lopez and I'm from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, and my father's family, um, they were from uh, Socorro, New Mexico, which is just south, about an hour. And in Socorro, we have an old land grant called Lopezville that has been around since, I guess like the late 1800s, but we've been in Los Lunas and in Albuquerque um, area since maybe like 1700s that we can like date back to. So we have this old property here called Lopezville. And you can see here, there's the mountain right there. The original houses are built of um, adobe, of their adobe homes that were built by my great-great-grandfather, um, Avelino, and um, beyond that, um, my other um, grandfather, Rafael Lopez y Luna and the family. And it's really interesting. Um, so I work, you know, with Adobe architecture as an artist with contemporary art, but I also have another foot in like Adobe architecture as like a construction method. Um, so I'm co-president of Adobe in Action, which is a nonprofit based in Santa Fe as well. So I kind of um, am in both, but it's really interesting with this property that I have. Well, my father recently gave me um, one of one of the old Adobe houses, but the original ones the original ones are adobe and then as time went on it became cinder block and half adobe and then the next one is like um frame and then the next one is like a tra like there was trailers so it's this really interesting um look at how through time there was more and more like a um less of a connection to land and to these traditional practices of adobe architecture and as like more fragmentation happens in the family or more um, lessening of connections within the family, um, that results, um, you can kind of see that in the lack of um, continuing on like this tradition with um, this vernacular architecture. And something really interesting about Adobe architecture is like, you know, you use what's available. Um, and so here in New Mexico, that's, that's mud, that's dirt. And so, um, so yeah, and so that was kind of originally when I was really started getting interested in Adobe architecture as an artist um, was partially because of, you know, my family, my Lopez family. And um, so my father recently gave me one of them and I'm fixing it up now. Here's the one across the street um, that my great, great grandfather built that's just abandoned and everything's um, abandoned. Um, and so that's a big reason why I've gotten so interested in in Adobe as, as, a, as a medium um, is, I mean, it's really uh, thinking about loss and fragmentation of family and relationship with um, traditional methods of, of building or stories or connection. Um, and so a lot of my work has been kind of um, trying to create new, um, new creative ways of how to like reimagine these these practices. Um, this is my father's house. He, this was an adobe house. This is what it looked like originally. It was all adobe. And then my um, father started putting on stones from the river. He got all these stones and he put them all over the house. <laughs> well, I'm, not, I'm going to interrupt, sorry, but I think we're not quite seeing what you're seeing. Oh, I don't really? Uh, and we just got some chat. I thought maybe it was just me, so I didn't say anything, but some chat. What is that? Um, try going to full screen, maybe, with the picture, because okay. we're seeing uh, all your uh, directories. Oh, shoot. Okay. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but... No, thank you. Can you see it now? No. No? Hmm. 
Maybe if there was just a PDF on your desktop, that would be the best way. Um, shoot. Okay. Well, you're not seeing, do you see this right here? And I'm like, now we don't see anything. Oh, wow. Okay. Hmm. Well, that's too bad. Although it was very interesting, that beautiful old house. Did you see the house? I saw the house and then it looked like there were other images behind it, but they were being shown in a certain view. Can you see it now? No. No. Anyone? No. Interesting. Maybe I should stop the share and then go back to it. Stop the sharing, put it on your desktop and then. It's right here. Do you see this? No. No? It's not actually sharing. Okay, let me stop the share. How about now? You'll see your entire directories and menus. Uh, but there's an image over to the right, and maybe we should just be happy with that. <laughs> it, this? Can you see these? Uh, it's not very big, but we can see it, right, Chrissy? Yes? Yes, but the, it's photographs all layered. Oh, really? Huh. Yeah. Shoot. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. Um, Technology, we love it when it works. Yeah. Okay, can you see this one? Nothing is on the screen now. Oh, that's interesting. Um, there we go. Um, so yes. we still see all of the directories and the menus, but there's an image there. Um, and maybe we should just go with that. <laughs> Yeah, so sorry about that. Okay. Okay, well, can you see the house can, now. Can you see this house right here? Yes. Now okay. the house, right. All right. Well, this is the house that I was talking about that my father re um, put a bunch of um, stones on from the river. And so um, there's this concept called resquache, and it's kind of talking about like what's available. Like you're using, you're using like the available materials, you know? And so um, this is made out of adobe and then just stones that are from the river. And so I became really interested in these, these practices based off of my own like, connection and relationship to them through family. So I went ahead and I started studying with um, Anita Rodriguez. This is her. Um, she's based in Taos. Let me know if you can't see these, okay? She's based in Taos, New Mexico. And she's an, a painter and an inharadora. And inharadora means um, woman mud, woman mud plasteress. And it's for um, mud plastering the exterior as well as the interior of Adobe homes. Um, let's see. Can you see these? Cool. Yeah. One with two women in it. Interesting. Can you see? You, you can see this. One. Pointing your cursor, we don't see anything. What do you see now? Sorry. I see, it's two women. Do you see that? Yes. Okay, great. So this is Anita, and this is her studying with someone, um, another in Haradora in Taos. And so I just wanted to kind of share these, like, this is called Elise, um, and it's, um, a clay that you find called caliche, and then you um, you process it with water and buttermilk, and then it's used as the interior clay slip for an adobe home on the inside. Um, and so I learned a lot of these practices with her in my early twenties, um, as well as with Carol Cruz. This is her. She's also in Taos, New Mexico. And this is a house that she built out there. Um, and so I studied with her a lot about like preservation. So you can kind of see where you like fill in the, the dark, um, the cracks for, for these. This is Carol. And so in my early twenties, I started studying with these women up in Northern New Mexico to learn these practices for mud plastering and the art of the enjadora. And I, um, I got really into it. I'm, I'm really, uh, and now I, I teach workshops um, called intro, their intro to Adobe architecture and mud plastering in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So, and so I started doing these things, but, um, 
And then I'll just show a quick example of my portfolio. Let's see. Okay, so you guys can see these. Um, we have a small picture of the, the, the it looks like the two doorway elements. Joanna, mm -hmm. if you um, go back out to share screen again and you have one of these images opened, you should be able to see that image and click on that frame and it should open it for you. Um, what do you guys see now? Because I have it in full screen for, for one. Right, of but we're just seeing the finder um, okay. frame. So you'll have to go back out and select a different frame. Okay. Um, go back out of share screen, I mean. Okay, so sorry about that. So go back. That's right. It's working before. All right. No. Do you see this? Well, we see it. Yeah, we can see it. It's still a small image. Really? It's so big on my, on my screen. Well, um, maybe I should go to my website then. Now you're going to have to share your website too. You'll have to back out of share screen share and select your website as the frame to share. Okay. Um, can you see this? Yes, we can. Okay. okay. Well, this is um this is an what I do as an artist is working with land-based materials and thinking about especially Adobe architecture as contemporary sculpture. And yeah, and so this was over at the Hispanic Cultural Center Art Museum, and um, it's also with cochineal insect dyed um, fabric behind that one. Um, let's see, here's another one. That was for the Fulcrum Fund called Resolana Public Art and Performance. And so thinking about bringing in community um, with these large scale sculptures. Yeah, and so here's um, it's another one that I did for Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art for their um, state of the art um, exhibition for 2020. And um, yeah, that was in Bentonville. So I've been doing, I've been working with um, Adobe Architecture as like a large scale sculptural practice based off of my family roots and also studying with women up in Northern New Mexico. So. I'm gonna go ahead and stop this share because I didn't do a very good job of that. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you, Joanna. Well, the images were very interesting. I think it's just a sort of side point that we couldn't see them as a full screen, but they were extremely interesting. And I wanna ask another question, but I would like to get sort of deeper into this idea um, of ancient science um, or ancient knowledge. Um, you've been touching upon it a little bit, but I'm interested in the idea that ancient knowledge was in a sense science in, in, at one time, you know, a kind of ancient science. Uh, and you know, what do you think of that? And how, you know, how do you utilize you know, ancient knowledge uh, in your work? And I, I, you touched on it, but just if you expanded a little bit, Starting with Joanna. Oh. Um, yeah, I mean, people have been working with mud for, for a very, very long time. And, um, you know, it's really interesting to think um, about Adobe architecture here in this region. Um, you know, indigenous people of this area have been using mud for a really long time, um, for, you know, millennia. and. Um, when the Spanish came over, they also came with um, Adobe architecture as a, um, a vernacular um, architectural techniques as well that they got from Northern Africa and um, Mesopotamia and China. So a lot of those practices of Adobe architecture came with the Spanish and um, you know melded and came together with the earthen um, knowledge that was already here. And so and it's almost like thinking about architecture as language because um, language has so many different words that we're taking from different places. And it's the same with architecture um, and um, specifically with, with Adobe. So it is extremely 
ancient and um, it's interesting to think about how it can be contemporary and how it is contemporary, it can continue to be, even if it's not, there's not as many um, practitioners of it. As so, um, it it's, well, it's global, but it all uses local the material of the, the earth and that's different everywhere. Right. So would you say that every culture, you know, has to deal with the makeup of their own soil um, and, and yeah. figure out the recipe? Yeah, it's usually um, about one, one third clay to two thirds sand. So it's like enough clay to hold the sand together, but not too much clay so that it cracks. Um, and then you can add some straw in there to kind of help with the binding. Um, yeah, and then there's all different types the colors and some is a little more sandy, some is more clay, um, and there's beautiful pigments. Um, it's it's an incredible practice. And one thing I do really want to say is, getting into this medium, it's not just about the medium. It's for me has been about the relationships. You know, meeting, getting to know my teachers, Carol and Anita, and there's this incredible um, community of people who work with Adobe Architecture in the Southwest, and it's been so wonderful to like. It's about the relationships and connection and it is about family and, and community. And so it's more than just a material, it's relationships. Right. So Chrissy, same question. Um, how do you draw upon, you know, ancient knowledge that developed uh, about seed culture? Yeah, I mean, I love what you just said, Joanna, about relationship, because I think that really points to um, this relationship that we need to come back to with the land that actually holds an ancient wisdom. And I think if we really take the time to slow down and to really feel into that land in a different way, we can access that wisdom. Sometimes she doesn't want to show herself. Sometimes those wisdom stories don't arrive. It takes time. She'll only, you know, that wisdom only arises when the wisdom says it's going to arrive. So you need to be patient. But yeah. I think, you know, the seeds, i just show, see if I can share a screen again. I'm thinking about seeds and really the ancient wisdom that uh, seeds share. So I'm just bringing this up again, actually the, oh, sorry about that. No. Um, on the left there, there's the uh, oats. From my ancestral, is my ancestral brain, the Scots could not live without oats. We eat oats all the time, our porridge, our oat cakes. So actually I grew oats for the first time a year ago on the land where the traditional ancestral grain of blue corn has been grown. And so in a way I chose to blend, you know, my chosen place of New Mexico with my homeland by doing that. And that to me, it's kind of teaching me part of that ancient wisdom. Um, I really, you know, when you, when you mentioned that question, Susan, I immediately though thought of um, Maria, see if I can find the, I know I can't find the slide, uh, here. Uh, Maria Sibylla Marion. Um, and this idea of ancient wisdom and science and how she, you know, in the 1700s, really through drawing and observation discovered metamorphosis. So it was through her acute observation. And that's what I feel that as creative practitioners, 
do all the time. We develop our kind of observation skills. And even when you, Johanna, are working with the mug, the adobe, you have to learn and observe through your feeling how that mud feels. Yeah. Don't you? So the, the mud holds a wisdom. If you were using mud from uh, Northern New Mexico compared to Southern New Mexico even, it would probably feel different. It does, yeah, it absolutely smells different. It sounds different. You know, um, the people who might've shown you that, that soil, it's like the people, you know, that that's connected to the, the, the um, clay that you have, you know. Um, Yes, I, I, I really feel that this idea of ancient wisdom and science is really deeply uh, ingrained in honing our observation skills and keeping our antennae really sharpened to pick up. And I think that's what scientists do. You yeah. know, and through that observation, perhaps I go to science for research. Perhaps I don't. But uh, I must admit, for me, I love to sit personally in the unknown. I love the mystery. And um, I don't know that I want the mystery solved sometimes. <laughs> I have to say that, you know, in my creative way of being. So, but I love science. I was going to be a scientist. Mm -hmm. But the world had another, another uh, route for me. Yeah, when I was in high school, I was on the track to become a botanist. Mm -hmm. And so now actually blending, you know, my creative practice, I call it, with seed broadcast, with the planting of seeds, has now kind of brought me back to that place I was in high school, not knowing if I should go to art school or university. Mm -hmm. I love that um, manuscript. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar with that, but it's, it's uh, so cool how she's sort of laying out this notion of observation, of detailed observation, and then recording the detailed observation so the reader could then maybe go on and build on that. Um, great idea. Yeah, no, I had the uh, amazing opportunity to see one, uh, her father was an engraver. So after she did the drawings, she eventually engraved them and then hand painted them. And I actually got to see one of her real books at St. Andrews University in Scotland. So that's photographs right. from her actual drawing and the engraving that was hand painted. They're fabulous. Oh, beautiful. Very, very inspiring. So I, I did skip a question, but I'm moving on here. I'll ask you one more question. I'm going to start with you, Chrissy. Um, it's kind of a long question because I kept adding ideas to it. <laughs> but uh, okay, so what, um, what thinking about this adobe making or seeds and planting as aesthetics. So how does the aesthetic dimension happen for you? How do you think the aesthetic component contributes to your effort? And by aesthetic, I mean something that the creator might feel making something, but also something that a user or viewer might tune into like a message, aesthetic as a two-way street kind mm. of. Chrissy. Gosh, yes, aesthetics. Such a huge question that I sit with all the time. I mean, if you look at a seed, that to me is a perfect example of absolute deep aesthetics. You know, it holds its core values of who she is right there, her essence. And I think aesthetics for me particularly are guided, aesthetics to me are really my core values these days and my ethical values of how I place one foot in front of the other. 
you know, which I've really learned from a lot of the farmers, a lot of working the land and how important is um, this idea of reciprocity rather than extraction and how that really is part of my core value is, and beauty. You know, I love the word beauty, even although I understand that beauty can be a cliche these days and um, my beauty might not be someone else's beauty. But to me, beauty is that balance, is that reciprocity, is that way of being in the world and it's not extractive, it's not a beauty that just comes to you. It's also a beauty that you give out. And I think beauty can be um, really resistance too. So it's, you know, aesthetics, gosh. You know, I do think aesthetics are important. As I said, it's to me about balance. And I do know that if I'm involved with creating something, whether it's an object or an action, if the aesthetics or the ethics, I'm going to use both of those, aren't right, it completely rubs at me and it won't leave me alone. You know, it niggles at me. So I do know that aesthetics are important. I wonder, you know, I'm going to throw this out because I, I sit because I do a lot of work in collaboration, not as an individual artist. I'm either collaborating with another human or non-human. But I wonder if aesthetics can be, there can be a collaboration. You know, can there be collaborative aesthetics? And can we come together maybe in an aesthetic solidarity? <laughs> I mean, I sit with that. I don't know. So it's interesting. I don't want to get too deeply into this, but uh, it's British aesthetic theory in the 17th century, 18th century, that became, um, you know, the analysis of beauty mm -hmm. uh, and the big push to separate beauty from ethics was mm -hmm. what your ancestors, Archibald Allison, the Earl of Shaftesbury, right. Edmund Burke, you know, they were all trying to figure out how to take, you know, beauty is perceptual and then ethics is something that the mind does. Um, mm -hmm. You're sort of undoing what they did in a way and um, putting them back together, um, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's very important for me. And I think, you know, I do that and I haven't learned, I've learned that really and truly that's part of the wisdom that I've been learning from place and I would say that wisdom has come from here in New Mexico actually thinking about that I love that so you too Joanna what do you think about um this notion of you know how does a building that you make how, how is it aesthetic yeah, um, I would say I'm pretty concerned with beauty um, and um, there's something very like, uh, you know, there's something very healing about beauty. Um, I, um, I might venture to share my screen again for my website so we can talk about aesthetics through my work. I'm gonna try it. Can you see my website? Yes. <laughs> All right. Yay. All right. Um, so, a lot, yeah, I would say my work is really in interested in form and color and shapes and um, texture and um, um, I think, uh, you know, aesthetics I guess we could go ahead and like uh, maybe look at this this was one project where I was thinking about land and home and materials and so they're like these little houses that are made out of natural dyes from the area and um, adobe bricks 
then they all have a lease on them. So that's that clay slip. Um, and thinking about how does, how does like these materials in relationship to a home, how are they like aesthetically um, interesting or um, what kind of combination can you put together for, to create a new type of aesthetic using already established ones. And um, I guess it's really interesting to think about, I guess I keep going back to Adobe architecture, but I'm just so inspired by it. Um, it's incredible good taste, you know, and thinking about like a mud floor, these like wood um, mud walls or, you know, the Vigas or um, Latia, like Latias, um, which are like smaller, smaller, um, branch uh, sticks and branches that you could put on the top or um, outside as well. And just um, thinking about how everything can be like an aesthetic to your walls, to your fireplace, to your floor, to the way that, you know, you make, um, you, you build the, like your, your life, like how you're living um, within your home and even to like how you're living your life is like an aesthetic, you know? Um, even the way we speak or how we treat ourselves and others. It's like, I, I think I'm really interested in, in art as well as like Adobe architecture. And, um, but then all thinking about it, maybe almost like something we live in, but then how does that pass into, yeah, how we live our lives. Um, right. Yeah. So the aesthetic is something that we see or we perceive um, that's kind of like a, a, a frame or a context for whatever we do, or it's more involved than that. I just, I was thinking, um, if I could just share my screen a minute, I was, Chrissy, I'm looking at something that I'm sure you know all about. Oh, it's not doing it, is it? Uh, oh, why is it doing it? This is just so, um, this shared screen is such an art. Mm -hmm. oh, all right, so here I'm looking at, um, Oh, can you see it? Oh, Here's yes. Long's line made by walking. I love Richard Long. Yeah, nice. I knew you'd like that. <laughs> it's just so I'm interesting. Just walk straight, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So he just walked. His whole artistic practice was just walking. And he would walk over an area so many times that it would make a line. Um, and so you don't necessarily have to think of this in an aesthetic manner. But maybe you do. I mean, it's just so striking <laughs> what he does. And it doesn't even stay around. It just kind of disappears. It's all, his work is all ephemeral. Um, and it's just sort of remarkable that, you know, that our notion of aesthetic has been able to ex expand uh, so much in, in this time that we could sort of ask questions about, um, you know, what is the aesthetic value of, of different kinds of practices Whereas mm. I think it would be very hard, have been very hard 50 years ago for somebody to, well, maybe not, just always do show. But anyway, I just wanted to mm. show that. Yeah, um, I, I also love the thoughts, uh, Johanna, about, you know, that notion of um, the aesthetic quality of uh, where we live, you know, and how, how that impacts our lives. So if you're living in an adobe mud home compared to a concrete brick home, yeah. how do you shift our way of being? And I, I feel that that's really essential. There was one time when I was um, in Scotland, I actually uh, worked with the great Jack Lecoq who uh, taught mime. And it's a long story how I got involved. I'm a visual artist. How did I work? <laughs> with this guy that was teaching, you know, mime. But he loved to work with a, a visual artist, but he talked a lot about architecture and the importance of how we move through space and how different materials impact that movement. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot about materials when I'm working like you do. You know, what impact does it have on us? What impact does it have on the aesthetic? What impact does it have on the non-human world, the world around us? 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think architecture definitely shapes um, how we feel and how our body is moving through space. And um, there's, yeah, there's, um, there's nothing like just, you know, thinking about it's what I think about um, with working with Adobe Architect. I'm actually in San Antonio right now working on a solo exhibition um, at Blue Star Contemporary. And I, I just built um, a pretty large, pretty huge um, Adobe sculpture just today and yesterday. And it's interesting to think of it um, almost as like working with ceramics. Um, and this is just like on a huge scale with sun dried bricks, you know, um, versus a kiln. And, you know, it's just like shaping and it's just it's huge and you know, can go really big with this stuff. And, um, you know, there's tools for like shaving off or, you know, for smoothing. And it's just really beautiful to think about you know, we're inside so much or we're in our homes or we're in uh, spaces and like thinking about how do you sculpt something mm -hmm. that, you, that you're, you're living within. Um, yeah, and then also, you know, we go back to the earth. And so it's interesting thing like just living within earth while we're alive too. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm seeing one question here um, to hear more about the community aspect of Adobe and the significance of tradition of women traditionally being carriers of this of it um i i was right so at the end get to that question but i wanted to um yeah. first um say that i i had actually had more questions but i i think i'm not going to ask them because time is kind of running out and i would like to open the floor to some of the other questions um here uh and that's one of them um that uh claire coats coat uh, is asking about. Um, hi, Claire. Huh? I'm just saying hi, Claire. <laughs> I'd love to hear more about the community aspect of Adobe too, the significance of the tradition of women traditionally being carriers of this tradition, uh, as I'm not going to pronounce this word correctly. So, and Aradoros, and perhaps how this has influenced your own practice. Um, saying that women's traditions have influenced your own practice? Is that what yeah, she's yeah. asking? Um, so one thing I would say about it is um, an Adobe home has its own lifespan and its lifespan is in direct relationship. And this is really talking about traditional Adobe homes, not no stucco, okay. Um, it Its lifespan is in direct um, relationship to the people who live in it or the community that takes care of it. And so as soon as the community or the, or the family, um, you know, disintegrates or moves away or estranged, the, you can see their direct relationship with the Adobe home because it requires maintenance and it requires a relationship to have, if you have an Adobe home, um, you know, there needs to be remudding, you need to be doing like the cracks. It's, it's almost like, it's like you're taking care of something. And that relationship of care isn't something that we're so used to, I think nowadays, like we, we want things to be really easy and quick and there's something like that as well. What was that? We want things to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, but there is something really beautiful about, um, yeah, like, you know, um, ideally, uh, this is, you know, you work with your family or community to to work with these, like, with Adobe architecture, because now what's really expensive with Adobe architecture is um, labor is really expensive to pay, because it, it's a lot of labor, and there's, the codes are also much more strict than, than they were, um, so, and also, um, and yeah, uh, women um, traditionally did the, the mudding. So that's um, in Spanish, it's enjaradora. So enjarar means to plaster in Spanish. And then enjare is like the mud. Um, there's other words, um, you know, I'm sure that's the one I'm familiar with. But, and then the men would be like more of putting the bricks on and then the women kind of mudded it. And so that's sort of like traditionally sort of uh, with that. And then also um, that includes the mudding of like the, the floor, or making the ordinals or the fireplaces. So, um, yeah, and then how this has impacted my own practice. I think it's when I met Anita and Carol, I really recommend looking up um, Anita Rodriguez and um, Carol Cruz. She has a great book called Clay Culture. Mm -hmm. And Anita has a great book called um, Coyota, Coyota in the Kitchen. Um, 
but just meeting them and they both had their own businesses for over 20, I think like 20 years or something, um, doing, working with earth, earth and architecture out in Taos and, um, they built their own homes with, you know, themselves and they're, be it's beautiful. And it's just so cool to be, to see that there's this tradition of women working with earth and architecture here in New Mexico and that, you know, um, I think it skipped a generation or something because, um, yeah, there's a, I think it's been, it's been really important to be kind of, um, I have a lot of other, this is why I got into it was because it's a part of my own cultural heritage here in New Mexico and wanting to like reconnect with that, um, especially because it's like, like an adobe might mean like, like home to some people, you know, it's like really symbolic and, and I, I know that I, it's not unique to me, there's a lot of people that I know who are also from this area, Southwest, and, you know, who, who want to connect with that because it's connecting to, you know, your ancestors or to land or to, to, to fragmentation and creating more reparation of, of, um, of like a healing or of a, uh, a rebuilding and creative ways of doing that, that um, work in this, this world, you know, that we're in and that we're continuing with because um, it's really great. I, um, it's incredible. And so Adobe in Action is a great um, nonprofit in Santa Fe. Cornerstones Community Partnerships is a nonprofit as well in Santa Fe that um, works on preservation of old Adobe churches in Northern New Mexico, um, as well as like national parks. So there are two um, really great organizations as well as the Earth Builders Guild. So those three things in New Mexico are, are, really, um, are really great. And there's some other um, artists who work in Adobe architecture, um, um, there's a few, so, but, uh, yeah, I'm just hoping to, you know, work with it more and share with it more and create more of a community of it here. Yeah. So I don't be, um, it's, it's extremely interesting. So that there's this sort of, you know, women's part of the practice that has really kept this practice going. Yeah. You know, and it's so beautiful because it's like, okay, you think about just mud, but it's not just mud. Like there's this material called mica, which is like a really um, glittery silicate mineral. And you can grind it up and then you can put it in the walls on the inside. And sometimes mud already has that naturally occurring, but it then if, if you, um, but if you, um, finish it a certain way with the sunlight it just all glimmers and it's super beautiful and just thinking about this little tiny like mineral that you can put in the mud as well or different colored pigments that you can put that are just from our from you know from the land around here and thinking not just like oh I'm an artist I work in the studio you know in this little box it's like no think about beyond the studio and what is our environment who are the people in our environment what are like relationships and like connections you can make and um, thinking about that, I think, um, as far as this place-based idea of art, you know, it's, um, I think, uh, just thinking like larger than yourself and like what, how, how can you connect, you know, connect with land, connect with people, like, and so um, I think that's where I get really, uh, you know, I'm passionate and it's, it's, um, it's been really, uh, it's been really wonderful. So, and I love what Chrissy does, um, with, with seed broadcasts and working with seeds, because those are so important. And those are also things that um, have been, you know, um, are being lost as far as people planting their own seeds or saving seeds or, you know, and going into different communities with seed broadcasts and doing the stories and collecting stories and collecting seeds and making a seed bank. Like it's such important work and, you know, making something more cohesive so that there's connections with different people um, throughout where we're living. Um, you know, I was thinking as you were talking, you know, about like community building through mudding, you know, and that, you know, you don't do that on your own. You bring in your family or the community to help to mud. And in a way it's a little the same with, um, you know, harvest, planting and harvest, that mm -hmm. it was always done in community. And there was certain traditional songs that you sing along with the planting and the harvesting and how you cook. So it's not really a singular activity. 
exactly it, it, it's something that i think is really inherent you know mudding and planting seeds i think go hand in hand actually you know that they're really like you can't that they're both similar kind of land-based activities and mm. are very much part of this place new mexico um you know, it's one of the few places, there's been a lot of um, seed savers from way, you know, obviously our indigenous peoples always saved seeds, but then there was people, incomers like me, that would come in and they came here to really make sure that the seeds were saved here and you could save them here because there's not a lot of big agribusiness, especially up here in Northern New Mexico. So a lot of the seeds are the traditional open pollinated non-GMO seeds. Mm -hmm. They are the traditional seeds and it's rare. It's a rare place, Northern New Mexico for that. Mm -hmm. And so it's really incredibly important. And we have a seed here. I saw there's somewhere a little question around climate change, but there is, um, you know, the traditional blue corn here, that it's a dry land corn. It was, you know, the Hopi and uh, Acoma Pueblos, a lot of the Pueblos planted their corn and it was a specific variety that's adapted to dry land farming. So you plant it in a very different way. They're planted really like a foot apart and about a foot deep. In fact, you go down, dig down as far as you can till you maybe find a little moisture. It can be like a foot down. And you have to learn, talk about observation and uh, wisdom of place to plant. You're actually reading the land about how the water, if it rains, if it ever rains, how that water is going to flow on mm. the land to come down to the corn. Mm. So there's a lot of really valuable ancient wisdom here in New Mexico that is really important around climate change. And seeds, the seeds are one of them. The, uh, so. So that was um, Anne, Anna MacArthur's question was about how has your practice changed due to climate change? Um, and, I wonder if, if um, Joanna, as your practice, does your practice reflect in any way the climate change here? Has it become more difficult to? I don't know why wood prices have gone up lately. I don't know if that's something with climate change, but wood prices have skyrocketed, I guess, and more people are using Adobe Architecture now, maybe a little bit more. Um, it was really hot the other weekend when we did the workshop because there's been super hot in Albuquerque, but that's probably climate change. I think Anna, I'm, uh, hi Anna, it's a great question. Um, I'm just much more aware of the materials I use and the impact and also the impact of whatever I'm creating or the communities creating. So um, the impact that might have long-term. So much more aware of that. I'm, I'm still a novice at it. I'm still really looking into that. Um, but I think it's an important thing, even if we can't completely change, that we're aware that we think when we're using a material to know about the material, where it comes from, what impact has it had on the earth to create that material. So just to know that, to recognize that, I think is really important. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that goes right along with the point that you made, Joanna, about the houses beginning to change from the adobe to the concrete, to the mobile home over yeah. generations. Yeah, um, one other point that I'll, I'll make with that is, um, so when it's just um, just regular adobe, it's just natural and it doesn't have any type of emulsifier in it. 
um, it's just natural to be um, like sand and clay and straw. It actually breathes um, because when it rains, it kind of swells with water, more moisture. And then as it dries, it dries out. And so it's almost like a, the adobe bricks breathe. But what um, started happening a lot, especially in the 50s, start, people started to like stucco um, their adobe homes so that they didn't have to do so much maintenance. But then what happens is if any type of water gets into, into the walls inside the stucco, um, it, it basically, the adobe bricks can't breathe anymore and they just get wet and they can, they start to, um, they can start to just melt. And then what you find with sometimes this phenomenon was sometimes with these old adobe houses that got stuccoed is there, there's nothing in there anymore. It's like an eggshell because it just melted. And so that's like an interesting metaphor too, of, um, these, like these old homes that just kind of melted you know, and that are eggshells of houses. Um, and so maintaining, you know, it's, it's really, yeah. And then also thinking about a little bit, just to bring up quickly, like thinking about uh, the Santa Fe style, that's, you know, um, that's like actually a, a law to kind of keep that aesthetic in, in Santa Fe. And it's literally, you know, that's based off of wanting tourism and copying off the aesthetic of Adobe architecture in the Pueblo Revival style. Um, but it's completely lacking any type of relationship to land or to community or to family building, you know, um, and, um, and to care of like this, this place. And, and it's not just care of the place, but it's care of those relationships. And so it's interesting thinking about this aesthetic that's the Santa Fe style, just, you know, trying to simulate Adobe architecture, which is actually, it's very, they're very different. Um, and so, yeah, I just think that's an interesting, something to remember or to, to be really aware of. Um, and there's, you know, there's also Adobe architecture in Santa Fe that's been stuccoed. Um, and there's all three of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna ask Amy, uh, do we have time for, I have one more question. Um, yeah. And we have a question from Andrea Poli in the Q&A section, which I could read if you would like. I was just going to read it. Amy. Oh, perfect. Thank Great. You. Um, so I would like to ask you to speak about how you see the discipline of design, the disciplines of design, art, and craft, design, art, and craft in the work you're doing and what you see in the future. Do you see those disciplines as coming together in your work or have they never really been separate for you? Would you speak about how these disciplines have functioned historically in New Mexico? Um, and I'd love Chrissy's thoughts um, and Joanna's. And I think, so once again, it's uh, design, art, and craft, thinking of them as separate or, or having merged. We just assume that they're merged. Oof. Well, for me, they've never really been separated. You know, I, I can't really separate those out at all. Um, and I think, Johanna, you can talk much more since you're from New Mexico around that, but I feel New Mexico really, that's why I kind of love it here because I feel traditionally none of those things were ever separated out. It, it, it's part of how you live your life. I mean, um, the craft of putting the seed in the ground, you know, how you plant it. I mean, it, it, it's, it's all connected. Sorry, I'm kind of mumbling here, but um, I don't see them separated out and I don't think they should be for my personal way of being anyway. Hmm. Hmm. Well, um thinking about specifically like Adobe architecture for like design art and craft and like thinking like okay you make a design because that's what um maybe the materials that you had on hand which is you know or you make a design because let's say I don't know um you have um vigas that hold up the roof because you know that only you have some mountains nearby and that's what's available for the vigas or um 
you know, it's a, a traditional old um, adobe roof is putting vigas and then putting um, latias, which is like smaller sticks on top, and then putting rabbit brush, like ch um, chimisa, dried chimisa and packing that on top and then putting dirt and then doing a, a clay top. And that's an old adobe roof and thinking about that design, you know, that's like, and then later on, you know, putting on, they had started doing like actual pitch roofs, which help with snow, but um, thinking like, okay, well, this is a craft and um, this is like a craft of an architectural technique. But then what I'm doing as well is thinking about, okay, how do I take these materials and make it into this contemporary art, you know? And what do those designs look like? Because those designs were based off of need and what was available. And, um, and then I'm thinking like, okay, what are designs that I'm gonna be putting into a museum? And how does, you know, those, di they're pretty different. Um, they're different, but connected. And so- The word art is much more complicated and sophisticated, the word art. Um, yeah, and can really sort of change things when you start using it. Um, but the craft and the design were really kind of based on the, in the land and the first place. The purpose, yeah. Yeah, right. the purpose, like why the design is based off of the purpose that's needed. Um, whereas, you know, what, what is the, you know, thinking about art and the purpose of why that design. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting thinking about a functional practice versus like, an, you know, when you're taking it to this aspect of art. Um, and uh, so for, I think for mine, it's like a little, little, it's, mm -hmm. it can be, they're different. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear that, but I really, um, I think the older I get, I'm turning, maybe turning away from that idea of art myself. Um, and kind of re-examining what it means, what that word means. I, I haven't really come to any conclusion yet, but I just feel at the moment there's, I mean, I can see how something functional that has this um, design element and it's designed because of that function is really important. And I think also art can have that same thing, can have that same, Absolutely. you know, whether it's a piece of art that stimulates, that, that causes someone to shudder. I love that. You know, I think it was John Berger said that beauty is something that makes you shudder. Mm -hmm. so maybe it's something that kind of stirs you or shudders you. Mm -hmm. It has a function. Yeah, you know, and that's what I love about Adobe architecture. It's not just um, this functional thing. It's like it's an artistic practice as right. well. And right. being about putting nichos in the wall or um, different colors or putting the mica in the wall to, for it to glimmer to like thinking about all these different little details that can go into your home. That's like a functional um, purpose. But yeah, there's it's an artistic practice. And that's how I see it. Um, and then just taking that even further into an art practice um, for, you know, um, as an artist um, and making work that way, but absolutely. And I think of, you know, even being like a farmer and working with all those different colors of corn or, you know, how you're planting them, like that's an art practice and that's, that's art. And so I, I yeah, I don't think it needs to be like object-based um, at all. Of, yeah, Richard Long you know, walking that path. Yeah, that's a practice. Um, yeah, so it's practice-based. It's such a deep question to come right at the, <laughs> the end here. Yeah, it is. The end, but that's it's a great question, up. Andrea. That's why I had brought up the idea of David Lynn's house yeah. in the 1970s as just something where he'd been trained as a sculptor and that's what he was, you know, he'd been showing and teaching but then he just decided, well, I'm I'm going to build a house. Yeah. And then it's sort of marginally a work of art. It's kind of a work of art in his head until someone from the art world comes along and includes it in an art magazine. Right. Says, you know, <laughs> yeah. Art. art. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Besides. Metamorphosis. Oh, you know, it, it you know, it's. It's um, it's a difficult concept to pin down, but it, you know, it definitely can mean 
that it changes the way you look at something. Yeah. And your work doing is changing the way people look at Adobe. Yeah, who are the gatekeepers of the, whether it's art or not? Um, I anyway, I think it's our job as creative practitioners or artists or whatever we call ourselves these days to actually always challenge, <laughs> challenge <laughs> that notion of what art is and how we're creating it and just keep that story alive and churning in conversations and by the work that we do. Um, so. Yeah. I love the work that you do, Chrissy. So oh, thank I'll you. I can visit you sometime. Actually, I do want to speak to you after because okay. the Adobe project. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. So it's, it's oh. just about six o'clock. And I'm thinking I wanted to thank everyone. For, I want to thank Amy for setting this up because she really put a lot of work into this. And, <laughs> uh, and um, Chrissy and Joanna, you've been wonderful. Um, and I want to thank the uh, interpreter. Um, I'm not sure um, where her image has gone to, but, um, uh, and don't forget the survey that Amy has included, which you'll find in the chat. Yes, please you. fill that out. Huh? Please fill that out. We can use it for reporting for our grant and we can use it for future funding for programs like this. So we really appreciate it if you would take the effort. It's very short and easy to fill out. And I will, yes, add it in chat again here. Someone said, Chrissy, love what you said about, do we bring our ancestors to our new land? Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that could be said about so many things. You know, do we bring our ancestors into this new practice, in your case, Joanna? They, they weren't making shows in galleries, but that's what you're doing. Mm. Um, right. Yeah, I really enjoyed the writings that you, you read. I actually screenshot them, Chrissy. <laughs> Yeah, they were really touching. Maybe I'll send you that whole essay one day. Okay. Is that your essay, Chrissy, or someone else's? Yeah, it's my essay. Oh. Uh, it's called Art in a Sense of Place, called Imprints. Yeah. And it was really based on me walking this river, dry riverbed in New Mexico, and what arose for me. So, so that's about it, I think. Turning it back over to Amy. Hi, sorry, I think I was sending that link to the panelists only. It's now in chat. Uh, so please go ahead and fill that out. Uh, and Chrissy and Joanna and uh, Susan, if you have any resources you'd like me to post on a page when we post this video, uh, I'll be in touch and we can get that together afterwards. Uh, so again, thank you everyone for filling the survey out. Thank you for coming and attending and asking great questions. And do you all have anything else you would like to add as we close? No, oh, I just want to say thank you to Johanna and Susan and you, Amy, and to everyone. It's actually really strange being here because we don't see anyone that's that we don't see anyone else but the panelists. So it's a little like just speaking to ourselves, but mm -hmm. thank you everyone that's out there and also just giving another deep gratitude to this incredible land and the peoples of New Mexico. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And so good to talk with both you and Susan, Susan and Chrissy. Um, if you want to see some of my work, um, I will be having a solo exhibition at Site Santa Fe on October 1st is the opening. So if you'd like to come and see some work, that would be work. Okay. Anyone who's watching, you should come. <laughs> calendars. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone. And I will be in touch with you about uh, resources that you'd like to share, and I will load that on our website. So thanks again. Uh, it was a fascinating conversation. I really appreciated listening in. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Bye everyone. I'm going to end it now. Bye. Bye. Bye.